Um, I was racking my mind for the last few days as to how to introduce my own presentation. But yesterday, there was a question that was asked which really gave me a perfect place to start. So if you remember yesterday in the afternoon session, a question was asked, which is, do we need anything more than Buddhism for enlightenment? And if so, why are we all studying science? Uh, a different way of putting the same question is, why are we here? Right? And that's a deep question, and it's a question that we need to ask seriously, because the fact of the matter is, it's exceptionally hard to bring two different traditions together. And while we are all being very nice to each other, we should not deny the fundamentally different historical trajectories of these traditions. So for example, forget Buddhism and science, which are anyway very, very large uh, areas of human endeavor. Suppose I was to tell a physicist like Chris that, you know, Cosmology studies questions of ultimate interest. Neuroscience studies questions of ultimate interest. So we should bring those two together, right? So we should do neuroscience of cosmology or cosmology of neuroscience or something. If you ask somebody to do, I mean, scientists will not take that challenge seriously, at least not at this stage today, right? So, so the idea that two disciplines that somehow ask similar questions should automatically come together is, on the face of it, a uh, generous thought, but to make it into a practice that works is very hard. And we should not deny that the difficulties that lie in front of us. And really, when you think about it, the times when such different things have come together is because there's some very pressing existential need um, which forces us to think through our basic assumptions. I, I see a hint of that yesterday, again, in Dr. Sonam's uh, presentation. Uh, I, I, of course, didn't understand all the jokes, uh, but it was clear that it's important for Tibetans that their cultural traditions have value and have importance in the modern world. In India, we faced that issue many, many years ago, right? As you know, or at least many people in this room will know, uh, India was more or less completely colonized by the British in 1857. And at that time, India went from being a independent conglomeration of nations to being a colony of the United Kingdom. And for the next 30, for 90 more years, we were a colony of the United Kingdom. That was a very tough time for us. And I'm sure the Tibetans in this audience will sympathize because if you think of the dominance of the British at that time, uh, at the height of British colonization of India, there were 3,000 Britishers in India. India even then had more than 100 million people. So 3,000 people ruled 100 million people, right? Uh, and that difference in power is really what led Indians at that time to say, we too have something. And a very watershed event was in 1894 when uh, a very young man at that time named Narayan Datta, better known as Vivekananda, uh, went to the United States. Right? There was a very famous world conference on religions in 1894, which was attended by Vivekananda, where he became a huge hit. And also by uh, the Theravadan monk, uh, I forgot, Dharma, no, I forgot, I'm uh, blanking on his name, and the teacher of D.T. Suzuki, right? So, so that conference in 1894 is when both Hinduism and Buddhism really made an impact in the West. And that is when it was first articulated that perhaps traditions of contemplative inquiry that came from Asia broadly 
had some value to the West. Before that, the idea was that the West will civilize this part of the world, right? And so we should not forget that there is this 120 year old history of people saying that there is some value to these traditions. Now, after Vivekananda, and incidentally, Vivekananda is one of the first people who articulates that contemplative inquiry, which is off, uh, and has its origins in the Indian subcontinent, is something that is compatible with science as well. Um, we don't really remember that much anymore, but you know, Vivekananda is a person of immense importance in this country. I mean, if you just walk down the road in front for a few miles, you'll see that there's a college called Vivekananda College for Skills. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a college for people who are not going to be monks or scientists, but somehow that person's impact on this country was so great that we are still naming colleges after him. But Vivekananda himself is no longer studied in philosophy departments, right? So, so if you look at professional Western or Indian philosophers, they don't take Vivekananda seriously. So this is, a, again, a puzzle, because the idea of unifying science and contemplation comes from people like him, and yet we don't take that seriously. And for good reason, because it was a simple idea of how the two should come together. Then. You know, we have um, the independence of India in 1947. Uh, as you all know, Gandhi, who was perhaps more responsible for that than anybody else, was again a person who brought a particularly Indian way of looking at the world uh, to uh, these questions of how do you create a modern state? How do you uh, make it democratic without uh, losing sight of your own traditions? These are all questions that we have been thinking about now for a hundred years or so. But India today is definitely not Gandhi's India, as I'm sure you're aware of. But in 1947, uh, when India got independence, it was soon after another exceptionally important event, right? which is 1945, this end of the Second World War, uh, as you know, ended with the atom bomb. And really, if you think about it, um, the great Western interest in Eastern traditions after the Second World War is because of the existential fear that was there as a result of the atom bomb, in my opinion. Right? Because, I mean, there are probably not too many people in this room who have done uh, nuclear drills or aware of how close we came to complete and total destruction. But in 1961, for example, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, you, know, you are probably minutes away from total war. Right? And so that kind of existential crisis led so many people in the West to believe that there's something wrong with science as it was occurring then, and that there needs to be something else that will temper scientific inquiry. And in the 60s in particular, many, many people started engaging with traditions outside the West, especially the contemplative traditions of India, Tibet, Japan, China, and so on. So what have we learned from that? Have we learned how to engage with major problems? Have we learned how to um, make the threat of complete destruction go away? Uh, I believe that the answer is not really yes. You know, we are still, if anything, uh, 50, 70 years from 1945, we are still struggling with the possibility that human action, collective human action, can completely end life on this planet as we know it, right? I mean, that is one of the biggest challenges of our time, which is that Humanity, for all its knowledge, seems to not have wisdom. And uh, I hear that also in what uh, Professor Chris said yesterday when he said that scientists cannot really tell the world how to live your life, right? That, that the discoveries of science can be used in ways that are not intended by scientists. Now, 
I do believe that we can critique that kind of claim as well, because at some stage, we are all human beings and we are responsible for the outcomes of our actions. So it's not just scientists who are responsible for making the world better, but scientists also have to work to make the world better. So the question then is, is there something that scientists and contemplatives have specially to offer in this quest? I mean, why only scientists or why only contemplatives? Maybe it's a responsibility of every human being to make sure that our worst impulses are constrained and instead we work together to you know, make all beings flourish as uh, in many people in this room would believe. But do scientists and contemplatives have anything special in that quest? And I believe that there is something special but that comes from both the internal developments of science in the last 50, 60, 70 years, and I believe that, that those internal developments have something special to talk to with the contemplative world. So what is that internal development? If you think about it, the first 300 years of science were primarily the sciences of matter. Right? Physics was the great science that was, we could argue, reinvented in the 16th and 17th centuries and was the dominant science till 1945. Even from then on too, there are fantastic discoveries that have happened in physics, but you could argue that the great discoveries of the 20, second half of the 20th century and going on now are related to information as much as they're related to matter, right? And the sciences of information, and which includes biology, and which includes computer science and mathematics, are the great new discoveries of our times now. And the questions that we are um, grappling with are really about the nature of information. Does information have value? Is information intrinsically neutral? If it has value, what kind of value does it have? And is there a science of value? These are so questions which earlier would be shoved off either to philosophers or to politicians or to decision makers are now fundamentally within the sciences themselves, right? Which is, what is the nature of information? Does information have meaning? And if it has meaning, do we have a theory of the meaning that comes from the sciences themselves. And what I want to give you is a very brief tour, if I may, of the sciences of information. Um, since most of you here have studied language, so let me use language as a way of conveying that um, science. When we human beings speak language in any tongue that you know, you use words to convey meaning, right? And we are so used to that that we don't even think twice because we assume that when we speak, others hear and they understand our meaning. And yet the complexity of that phenomenon is so um, astounding that we still don't know how that works. In the, the mid 20th century, people recognize that language has rules that can be codified using the sciences that were being developed, which is the computer sciences. So give me, let me give you an example. In English, I can say, Rajesh is speaking in Dehradun. Right? Then I can say, Rajesh, who is uh, an Indian, is speaking in Dehradun. And I can say, Rajesh, who is an Indian and wearing a red sweater, is speaking in Dehradun. Each one of these sentences is understood by native speakers of English as being perfectly grammatical and meaningful. And if you are hearing the translation in Tibetan, presumably you are hearing it also as grammatical and meaningful. And yet, it's probably the first time in human history that the sentence, Rajesh who's wearing a, green, a red sweater and is Indian is speaking in Dehradun. It's never been spoken before. The probability of that is so low that it's probably never happened, right? Somehow, therefore, something that is new, never happened before, is understood by everybody. How is that? So the sciences of information have to engage with that question, 
which is that somehow new information has been provided to you, in this case a sentence, you as a human being, speaker of English or Tibetan or any other language, understand it perfectly, and yet nobody taught you some explicit rules that will make you understand it. You know, it's not like learning math or learning, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, Buddha, uh, the eightfold way of the Buddha. No, it's never been taught explicitly. So how is it that human beings do it? How is it that other animals who have similar kinds of capacities do it? Which is to say, how is it that living creatures inhabit a world in which things have meaning to them? And how do they make meaning of things that they have never experienced before? This is a problem that in the biological world is universal. Okay? And for a while, people thought that they would solve this problem purely using mechanical procedures. So that's, that's the great hypothesis of Turing and others who claim that the mind is nothing but a computer. Right? And the claim, therefore, is that somehow, through some computer-like operations, we understand what we mean when we speak whatever we speak. But there are strong reasons to believe that purely mechanical procedures may not capture to everyday speech. Nothing special, just what we do every day. And, uh, famous thought experiment was done by a philosopher named John Searle to illustrate that. It's called the Chinese room experiment. But I'm going to call, given our setting, I'll call it the Tibetan room experiment. Okay, so just imagine me. I don't know a word of Tibetan. Now, I, there's a machine which claims to know Tibetan perfectly well. So I go to the machine and I ask a question, you know. I ask a question in saying, how do I get to the second, you know, cosmology meets consciousness meeting? And that machine gives me a perfect answer, okay? And somebody says, see, we have invented a machine that speaks Tibetan perfectly well. And I go away thinking, wow, you know, some really smart people must be over here. But actually what's happening is, behind the machine, there is some person who takes the card in which, like, maybe there are cards like these, right? So, there, so the person takes a card that, in which I wrote my question, feeds it into the machine. Inside it is somebody who takes the card, looks at the letters one by one, takes a book out of a shelf, compares what the book says to what is there on the card, writes another symbol, and so on and so forth, and eventually he replaces each symbol in which I have written the question with a symbol in Tibetan. And then he does something mechanical, feeds it back, and out comes the answer. So John Searle basically says, the card doesn't know Tibetan, Rajesh doesn't know Tibetan. The person who is consulting the card is just using books, so he doesn't know Tibetan. Where in all of these put together is the understanding of Tibetan? Right? And so basically his claim was that no mechanical procedure would somehow be capable of understanding language, even though it could pretend to understand language. Right? And this remains a puzzle in the understanding of the mind even now, right? which is that when we speak or when we have perceptual experiences of color or shape, we have those as having meaning and value. Right? So when, when I have a pain in my left molar somewhere, in my, in my jaw, it doesn't feel like just, oh, there's a pain and it's uncomfortable. No, the discomfort and the pain come together, right? So the pain has a negative value in the way I experience it. So where does that value come from if it's not just a purely mechanical procedure? These are the questions that the sciences of information have to engage with. Now you might think this is a very arcane technical topic, 
right? That no, you know, who cares whether computers can can have meaning and value or not? But you can see that this is a metaphor for the larger scientific enterprise. If you think that there's nothing else in the world besides abstract operations that have no meaning or no value, then it really doesn't matter whether I blow up the whole world or not. I mean, if it has no value, no meaning, you can do whatever you want with it, right? So, so these questions, which seem technical scientific questions, There we go. Um, so these technical scientific questions, for the first time perhaps in the history of science, are tied to larger human concerns of what is meaningful, what has value, what should we do in this world. And as it so happens, and it's not totally surprising, because if you think about it, 100 years ago, a revolution happened in physics, which happened at the same time as a revolution in human relations as well. So there was immense violence 100 years ago, which ha happened at about the same time that uh, there was a lot of shift in, in the human understanding of the material world. Uh, so somewhere I believe that these two trends, a moral and a material one, go together. And so I think that just as that happened 100 years ago, we are again approaching a major crisis in the world where technical revolutions in our understanding of value and meaning are going hand in hand with an existential crisis about the very future of humanity. Right? So is there something that we can do to address these together? I mean, and I think that that is really where scientists and contemplatives have a important role to play the main reason is simple, which is that scientific traditions, again, from the inside, I'm not saying this is something that scientists have to do outside of science. From inside of science, there's a demand for understanding how our meaning, value, information coming out of material interactions. At the same time, you have contemplative traditions which, who have investigated the nature of meaning and value for thousands of years. So can we actually bring these two together, not to study stars and planets, though that would be fantastic, but to study a much more focused topic, right? A topic that has traditionally been studied in these two traditions. So let me give you an example of something. Again, it's a little technical, but bear with me. In um, Indian philosophy, there is a term called arthapati, right? Arthapati is, um, is a form of reasoning. And I'll give you an example, and I'll use the Indian terms for it. So suppose you go to your friend Devadatta's house, and you knock on his door, and his mother answers the door and says, Devadatta is not at home. And you say, oh, he must be at work, and you go away. So you have, from, some, from the fact that Devadatta is not at home, you have inferred that he is at work. How did you do that? Right? And, and Indian philosophers debated for a very long time whether this is just inference or is this a unique kind of reasoning of its own. And what's so interesting about it is this is exactly the kind of thing that computers do terribly. So if, if I lift this phone here, everybody knows that the phone is no longer on the table. Right? I don't have to demonstrate to you. But if you try to build a computer that knows that whenever you lift an object, it's no longer in the place where it was before, we have not been able to do that. So at MIT, somebody spent an enormous amount of time and built a fantastic computer which did exactly one thing, which is that it would know that if you walked around a room collecting Coke cans, then once you've collected a Coke can, it's no longer in the spot that it was at. That's all it did. It didn't, so if you replace Coke by Pepsi, you wouldn't have been able to do it, right? And so this general purpose reasoning that we have, 
which is that once an object is no longer in its original location, it's somewhere else. This is something that human beings do automatically. It's something that, as it so turns out, people in Indian philosophy studied for a long time. And so it's an example of something which is a very, very concrete phenomenon that was studied in our traditions, but which has enormous implications for technical inquiry in the very cutting edge of computer science. Right? So I believe that it's actually that kind of work that will make a big difference. So it's not going to be general purpose inquiry on what is valuable and what is not. It's going to be, I mean, like any scientist. You cannot do science by asking, how did the universe begin? I mean, that's simply not a good way to do science. You have to ask very focused questions. In the same way, right? You cannot just ask, what does Buddhism think about the origins of knowledge? No, I mean, Dharmakirti thinks differently from Nagarjuna about these kinds of questions, right? So I believe that, therefore, the right way to bring these two together is by asking very, very focused questions and doing that in such a way that it brings all the resources that we have built in the two traditions to bear on that kind of targeted question. Right? And that's what, if you look at my talk, that's what I call a, pers you know, a person who looks at the future of these two uh, traditions together is what I call a dharmanaut. Right? Somebody who is not just saying, oh, what a great tradition Buddhism is. You know, there must be something fantastic. Or who says, oh, what a great tradition science is, and therefore, you know, we should all learn science. I mean, that's, that's great, and it's great to popularize both of them. But if you really want to make contributions for the future, you have to go beyond generalities and ask specific questions. And I believe that there are many, many such specific questions. So for example, we all know that climate change is due to human action. At least most people in this room, I hope, believe that. Uh, there are people who don't seem to believe it for reasons that are uh, unfathomable. But uh, suppose that we all agree that climate change is an outcome of human behavior. Then the question would be, just as we know that contemplative practice leads to shifts in the brain, are there specific contemplative practices that if you do, will lead to shifts in, say, consumer behavior? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. But I believe that those are the kind of questions we would have to pose and address directly to make an impact on the kinds of challenges that we face in the future. So with that, I'll stop. And Okay, it's good. We have a nice amount of time before lunch break, so I invite the Geshe's to ask questions first. Cruise so if you see that uh, there is a, a danger of whether the uh, human species on this planet can be uh, continue or not, Oh, yes, there's a danger, and for and um, that was uh, that kind of thing was um, I think heard in your uh, presentation, uh, and uh, uh, if that is in the same context, then the, my question is that uh, uh, 
do we have the um, uh, concerns about the uh, future generations about whether we can um, pass on a clean environment to them or not? Um, I don't have anything special to say about this. Uh, also, the idea that there is existential concern is not mine, right? I mean, I think anyone who's a thoughtful person who reads the newspaper should be worried about um, the future of humanity. Uh, so I think that given that, and given, I mean, maybe someone like Chris can answer this question better, but I believe that climate change is no longer a possibility. It's happening, and it's going to happen, and it's going to get, it's, it's likely that we are past the point of no return. So, so the real question is, what can we do to mitigate its effects, not what can we do to prevent it? Mm -hmm. Ditola and again, Chris Tabuja Kilen, Gabi Mena, Pijale, Yaja Tul Samudus, Imbi Mena, Nizuchi, Shebi Mena, Anitanda, Anit Kuru, Gurwa Drugu Yore, the Mares, Kaja D, any Yomaresta, Gurwa Drugu Yores, Chesa, Tanda, Gurwa Chimba Dia, Anit Kawaji Lady Yores Labena, D, Mongo Chima Tobiaki, any Ta, Tanzamli, I guess Simbeki, any Ta, Nizuchi Lady Yores. Chizatan <laughs> Oh, Tampotan, uh so you talked about the second world war and the, uh, the disaster of the atomic bomb uh, and uh, I believe that uh, this kind of uh, problems happen because of the lack of uh, uh, restraint and the lack of compassion in uh, all of us. Uh, and so in order to prevent uh, such kind of events in the future, uh, if we uh, had a, a kind of a third kind of a world war, then it would be more uh, disastrous than the uh, previous two. So, uh, I believe that uh, in order to prevent uh, um, uh, such kind of disasters in the future, uh, I believe that um, the, um, the teaching of uh, compassion uh, and uh, the contemplative uh, traditions uh, in uh, kind of a secular way uh, in the modern education system is very important. So do you see a kind of a future um, of a secular uh, compassion-based uh, curriculum for the uh, education system? Um, I mean, I think that independent of whether it will help, I mean, I think that some kind of such training is necessary whether it leads to a um, better world or not. 
right? I mean, we can't really plan to take on such huge challenges, but I think compassion training is a good idea, you know, even if you just want to be nice to your neighbor, so. Shinki, <laughs> This is a this is actually a question that came up from a number of geshes, so I will put it into one. Um, you provoke people, of course, a lot with your abstract. So, by in in terms of reversing this typical relationship of Buddhism being ancient and science being modern, could you would you explain a bit? So, so what I was trying to say there is, the future challenges that we see are are challenges that should be familiar to any contemplative tradition, right? Meaning science is changing literally our experience of who we are. It's happening, right? I mean, and I think that Professor Chertler and others will talk about specific technologies that are making that happen. So given that these changes are happening, given that we are changing, our environment is changing, I mean, this is, in a sense, a very familiar territory if you're a Buddhist, but at the same time, the human condition is not that of 2,500 years ago. Right? It's, it's not. I mean, so, so there is a dramatic increase in the amount of information that's around. You know, if, if we, we might soon be in a situation where every day we add more information than what of all of human history until, say, five years ago. So given that there are dramatic new challenges, and yet there are concerns that are ancient, is there something that we can do to address those from this contemplative perspective? And I think that it cannot be just more of an ancient tradition. It has to be something new. That's what I meant. Thank you, Langi. Um Tiwadi Tanda <laughs> Karinyungiwa I, I have a question. Um, it, one of the things going forward that in your vision, which we presumably have to address, is the fact that the Western thinking and Western science are very progressive. Mm -hmm. they're, they're a motion, movement towards increasing, mm -hmm. growing, mm -hmm. getting bored. It doesn't have to be purely materialistic. It's mm -hmm. progressive. Mm -hmm. It's not clear to me that the 
the other the contemplative tradition embed progression in that same way is that a problem i mean and for instance just because we tend to i mean i'm a you know strong advocate of science and i while i will recognize nuclear weapons and bad consequences i will say you know 100 years of science and technology have raised one and a half billion people out of poverty and added 30 years to human lifespan and that's a huge positive thing that's almost invisible to people because they amortize it into their thinking and accept it. But the question is, how do we reconcile the progressive, acquisitive, materialistic, sometimes nature of the Western pursuit with the right. Eastern ideas? Uh, Anything <laughs> Anikaji <laughs> Um, this is probably a long discussion, actually. Uh, but I actually think that I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm 100% for progress, right? I believe in Star Trek, so uh, in that sense, uh, and even the term dharma not suggests, you know, that kind of progressive element built into it. And, but on the other hand, I don't think that idea of progress is only a modern Western notion. I mean, you could argue that the immense ferment in India, say, 2,500 years ago, was a very progressive vision, an enormous new um, forms of knowledge arose out of that very inquisitive and curiosity-driven inquiry, right? Of course, you could say, and I, I believe in it, that in the last few hundred years, we have not been particularly um, curiosity or progress driven in this part of the world. And, and there are reasons why that's the case. But I don't think that's a structural feature. So, so if anything, we would have to, uh, and without offending my um, colleagues to the left, I do think that the traditions of this part of the world will have to give up on lots of their cherished notions in order to make that kind of progress. Uh, uh ane <laughs> Ta 
Anitik tanda manzu syarjo ki anitik yudu nang lo yebe ki rikwe shung lo dinzu ki nang lo ni namgu ane sojun ki tola kechen bote diye ki ane nizu mang bocik ane ta thorgu re thorgu gu re thorgu gowa thorwa cha gu cha yures ndu yus 